Hello, everyone, and welcome to Journey to Success Radio, a show featuring people and companies who are making a positive contribution to the world. This show will help you learn how to apply success principles in every area of your life so that you can make the most out of your skills and talents and accomplish more of your goals. To find out more about the show, please visit www.journeytosuccessradio.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Journey to Success Radio. Uh, your host for today, myself, Peter Gorrell. I'm Vice President of Business Development and Client Relations at TechBlocks, a company designed to help clients of any size prepare themselves for the transformation to the digital world. My special guest today is none other than James Martin, an innovator. James is a CEO and founder of Copa Divino, and he's a founder of Sunshine Mill Artisan Winery and founder of Quenet Winery. James is a native of, native of Oregon and grew up in the Dallas lo- location, located just below the Columbia Basin of the world-renowned Columbia George. He's a seventh-generation farmer whose, own, whose family owned cherry farms and his family's Farms grew to become one of the largest cherry producers in the Pacific Northwest. Some of you may have already witnessed uh, James live as he appeared on ABC's Shark Tank. James's season two appearance is still one of the highest viewed segments of the series. With no shark investment, Copa Divino went from $500,000 in, in sales when he launched in 2009 to more than 14 million in 2014. He made history when the producers asked him to return to the shark tank. No, well, during his second appearance, he and the sharks continued the conversation and heated discussions. In the end, James chose to walk away because he felt the sharks' goals were not aligned with his vision for COPA. Stick to your vision, know your plan, know your business, and know your game. I think that is an excellent uh, platform. James, welcome to the show. Thank you, Peter. It's great to be here. Great. And and I'm a big fan of this show, I'll tell you. And I actually uh, witnessed both segments. And um, and I, I sensed, uh, you know, obviously the first time you – uh, there was a little heat on you, but the second time, boy, you were cool. I saw you. You really, I love the way you managed your way through that. Tell us a little <laughs> bit about that experience firsthand, because I know many of us will never go through that. Well, it's 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 quite an extraordinary extraordinary process. You you're actually at the ABC studios, which is an old Paramount um, studio facility. It's extremely uh, uninsulated. And, um, and so on the very first show, what uh, ended up making mine so memorable and, and the season premiere and actually the highest rated show in the history of the show was that I was standing on the set in a turtleneck that a producer had told me I'd look really good in. And uh, that turtleneck, of course, was the wrong thing to be wearing when it was 95 <laughs> degrees out and um, and underneath those those studio lights, I was just cooking. So during this process of, of making this offer from uh, from the uh, the sharks to myself, um, I started sweating profusely. Oh, so I'm probably most famous for, for how much I can sweat. <laughs> and it made incredible television drama because here's this guy getting this, this really, uh, you know, tantalizing but painful offer from Kevin O'Leary and uh and I was I was just uh you could see a puddle underneath my feet I was sweating so so badly <laughs> so it really it made it it made it seem as if I was under stress for that reason I was actually under stress thinking how quickly can I get off this stage because I knew I could hear my my wife and my children all laughing at me and the and so I, you know it turned into be, being a very embarrassing moment and luckily our company became very successful, so the second yeah. season was um, was very successful for the Shark Tank in the U.S. And they asked me to come back for um, for another episode. And I came back on the second episode, and at that point, our company had gone from 500,000 sales to five million in sales. And um, 
received a great offer from, from Mark Cuban. Unfortunately, Kevin O'Leary as well. He was a part of a group with, with Mark and, and Roger as well, who's very popular and a Canadian, as I understand as well. Yep. And um, uh, Robert, Robert Hertzvik. Yeah. Yeah, Roger. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it's, unfortunately, it was, a, it was kind of a low ball. And that yeah. was the game that they play. And at that point, um, I think I was tired of, uh, of playing games. We, we really knew what we had created. We knew the value of it. And, um, and I wasn't willing to go ahead and, and uh, sell my company for a lot less than what its value was. And, uh, you know, truthfully, there's a tremendous amount of children who watch that show too. And my 13-year-old son at that time, I knew was watching it as well. And he had told me going in, Dad, if you take anything other than what that price is, I'll never talk to you again. Now that's so, sage advice. In my head the whole time. <laughs> and, and, and so some people say, gee, you really stuck to your guns. No, I just didn't want to get in trouble with the family when I got home. <laughs> now before we get too far down uh, this hole, because I, we obviously do want to uh, ex- ex- explore some other uh, elements around that show, is uh, for the sake of the audience that hasn't been exposed, to Copa Divina. Uh, perhaps you'd uh, give us an, a, a bit of a, a, a capsulization of your business, what it is, and, uh, and how it fits into uh, the market. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're a, a company that created a way to bottle wine in a wine glass or cup. Um, the value to that is that the consumer doesn't have to take a bottle of wine, open four servings at once, pour it into a glass, they don't have to have a corkscrew, they don't have to have glasses, so it really makes a, a product uh, very easy to drink. Um, we happen to put some higher quality wine into it too, so it's that eight, to, well in, in Canadian terms, I, I would say it's the, uh, you know, the 12 to $20 bottle of wine that you're able to get for, in, in Canada we sell for three ninety nine. Right. So it gives you good quality wine for a very uh, fair price. You don't have to open a bottle. And, again, ready to drink right out of the container itself. And this innovation has created a category. We see lots of other competitors in the space now. We're still about 80% of the market. So it's it's been a very successful launch for us. Um, obviously, we think we're just in the very beginnings of this category. There's a lot of uh, new generation products that we'll be coming out with over the next two years that are focused on being able to have products that are ready to drink an appropriate container. Um, cocktails are a- actually something we're extremely excited about. And, uh, and so it's, it's, it's been an amazing uh, ride for a family that's really um, more ag-related and farm-related in its roots, um, but have ended up on this really entrepreneurial journey as well. Yeah. Well, you know, I think uh, when people think of farmers, they default to this kind of uh, man of the, you know, man of the earth, uh, kind of individual, and uh, you know, I've been exposed to some of that too. And they're usually very down to earth people, very practical. I can sense just in your approach. And I mean, I've watched you on television, despite all the lights and that. I thought you were a very cool and calm individual, regardless of what was going on in front of you. And you're seventh generation on the farm, so uh, I, you know, people would think like, how do you innovate? from, you know, within something as grassroots as farming. I mean, did you actually sit down and try to organize something? Did it come, did you get an epiphany? Tell us how that, uh, how it came about. Well, I think the one thing about farmers uh, that they deserve credit for is, is they're, they're typically a sole proprietor. They're, they're usually their own CFO, their own CEO. Um, they're their own mechanic, repairman. They're their own agronomist. They they have to know just about something about everything, and and they constantly got to come up with a solution. Oftentimes, on their own, and and be inventive and 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 be very cost effective. So I think that um, you know farmers may be undercredited for for being so universal in, in their abilities. Um, and I come from a family that has been farming cherries for a long. Time and you raise your children well, and they go off and uh, go to college. And, and so I was educated and, and um, did work in the tech industry for a while and got some great experiences there before I returned back. But you're always grounded in, in the idea of the next generation. You're always grounded in, in a life continuum. You're always rooted in, in not thinking about what your needs are right now, but thinking about what the next generation's needs are going to be as well. And so this project actually started around an old building in our in our town, actually an old property of buildings that was an old flour mill 
and just this beautiful structure that had sat vacant for 20 years, and we were looking to save it from being torn down. Um, we'd actually had one of the buildings, watched one of the buildings being torn down, a, a, a 25,000 square foot brick warehouse that was built in the 1870s, one of the very first things built when the railroads came through Oregon. And so we were trying to save this building from being torn down, and we just started a winery, and so we started presenting ourselves as a developer to the city that was trying to tear all this down. And in that quest, we needed a project. And with that project, we needed it to be pretty substantial. So we needed to expand our winery very quickly to occupy the space. And with that, we started thinking about what could we do that was much larger scale than just your traditional winery. Mm -hmm. And I went on a 20-year anniversary trip with my wife in France, was sitting on a bullet train, bought some some wines in the beverage car, ordered a Syrah, ordered a Cabernet. And one of the products that I ordered, the Syrah, was actually sealed in a wine glass. And I've never seen anything like that. And as a winemaker, I was just stunned by it. And, of course, annoyed my wife for the rest of our trip, talking continuously about the idea of, wow, if, if you could just open and drink just like beer or like pop, how much wine would be so much more accessible and and with that concept, came back and, and started working on how we could go ahead and, and be uh, the first producer of something like this in the U.S. And so we became partners with the company in France, developed a much higher speed um, packaging system, right. and then worked on a lot of automation. And uh, and we're, we're able to use that for the, the foundation to save these buildings, which now we've moved into – expanded substantially, uh, employ over 50 people here on the property. Um, so we've reoccupied this 100-year-old property Excellent. that uh, sat vacant forever. And, and so, you know, we were driven by altruistic reasons, but still needed the entrepreneurial uh, um, intelligence to go ahead and, and make something that could cash flow and, and, and be successful. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been an incredible ride, um, not only in just how great the product turned out to be, but in, in all the other uh, aspects of providing jobs and, and saving, you know, an old property. Yeah, oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. I remember, you know, you, you mentioned about the, the unique packaging. I remember, I think that was one of the stumbling areas of your time on the, on the, shark, on the shark Tank, because I think it was Kevin O'Leary who actually saw through that, and in fact, he couldn't get his head around it being a packaging play versus a, a consumer play. Am I, uh, talk, to, talk to me about that a little bit. Uh, I mean, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, you know, we had thought about packaging for other wine companies, and, and since the Shark Tank show, we have done some of that. Okay. And I think that our, our passion was really around creating the first brand, being, you know, first to market with, with that brand. I'm wanting to make sure that, that you know, the, the package – category that we were creating had higher quality wine in it. I didn't see a, a value personally to myself of wanting to create some jug wine product that was all about, um, you know, being a, the commoditized price in the marketplace. I really felt like there was a, a real premium aspect to this, this premium package that it deserved to have um, higher quality wine in it that gave consumers an access to that without opening four servings in a bottle every time they wanted something. So right. So yeah, yeah no, I get that clearly. That's uh, and of course you stuck to your guns. I mean that's 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 really a, a, an amazing thing. Since the show, what kind of things have happened to you though? Because I I know that you know they uh, you know they talked about you being a bit of a, a an advertising hog and that you really just. You know, you you went on the show twice just to get the extra boost. I mean, naturally, you're going to get some airtime. I think everyone does that that goes on television. But what has really taken place since that show? Well, I, I think going back the second time, obviously, there, there's 6 million viewers per, per episode. So it's, it is an amazing opportunity to put your brand in front of people. But if I had, if I had gotten the, a legitimate offer, um, I would have taken it for certain. So I was there for the right reasons. Um, at the same time, I think that you know, we became a, a different version of what you don't see very often in the Shark Tank, and, and that version is that you don't have to succumb to uh, heavy investor uh, pressure 
to be able to make your vision happen. Uh, oftentimes, you know, boot, bootstrapping is completely underrated, and, and, and being able to really know what's under the hood of your tractor as a farmer or under the hood of, of what your business is 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 um, is my responsibility, and, and having an investor who's seen your business for ten minutes, they really don't know what the potential is or or, or how to direct it, and and so you've got to be extremely careful of what kind of money that you would take into a company. And, and truthfully, um, there was no chance that I would ever take an investment from Kevin O'Leary. No chance I would ever be in business <laughs> with Kevin O'Leary. Um, I, I don't think there's a single business that he's, he's invested in that many would say is, has, has been successful. And I think the, the reasons that he does things are the reasons that most businesses fail. If you're following the dollar all the way to the very end, then you're missing out on, on, on the dream and the vision that you have to go ahead and, and have everybody else follow. And that includes the, the consumer. And that's how you build a brand. And, and he, he hasn't built any brands. He's certainly been very, very successful. But Oftentimes, in most cases, it was it was you know stealing or financing his way uh, to the top of another business. It had nothing to do with brand building, and and nothing to do with consumer connection. So um, so we've been lucky that way, but we've also been lucky that the fans who watch the show um, have uh, have really latched onto what we're trying to do and understand the passion behind the, the product as well. So. Um, and it's been fun to be kind of – I was one of the first classes or the first uh, entrepreneurs on, on that show um, to have a great deal of success. Mm-hmm. So we've we become uh, you know, a very, uh, I think, important story that um, it's not whether you get an offer and turn it uh, – get an offer and turn it down as we did. Um, it, it's what you do after, after the show. And, and so there's still a lot of hard work that goes behind all of it. Right, right. And you've just opened the door to something that I'm really fond of, and that is the, the thought leadership that's around learning and, 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 you know, and creating leadership styles, because you've started to talk about some things that I know that our audience on a regular basis are really interested in hearing about. And if, if you could, I mean, you probably have, I'm, I'm just guessing that you maybe have some systematic approach to uh, leadership or things that you've learned about your own personal leadership style and, uh, you know, and how meaningful uh, um, an effort, you know, you've put together in order to make this uh, co- company successful. Uh, I have learned, uh, I think, 10 MBAs doing this this project for sure and, and <laughs> learned a great deal about um, wanting to always have people on the team that really share in the vision but also our team players. Um, you can have a, a team of, of superstars, and, and you can have a lot of chaos. And it, it ext- and the company struggles with focus because you've got several people who only pull their direction. Or you can have a team of all stars, which is what we've really focused on, and and that all pull together. And um, so we've, I think we've been extremely successful because we have uh, a, a really really strong team orientation. And uh, a team of equals, and um, and you know we're we're very very visionary in the way that we we discuss everything that we're doing, including the development of the company and and the people within the company as well. So we focus on improvement in all areas, and and not just in in professional improvement, but in social improvement. Uh, so the way that we communicate is so important. The way we communicate with with our distributors, the way we communicate within our organization. Um, it's so much more efficient when everyone has a level of understanding of where we're supposed to go together. Right, right. I've been talking with a lot of CEOs over the last uh, six months or so about cultural changes that are that are happening in 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 the industry of all kinds. And do you have uh, a, is there a certain culture that exists at uh, at Copa that uh, that you could demonstrate uh, to the audience? Well, I, I think if there's anything that's unique to our business is we're 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 hyper entrepreneurial, mm-hmm. um, and and so everyone in the company has ideas. Everyone has has the ability to add to the dream, and and so we're constantly um, requesting that. But at the same time, um, as a team, we go through a real strong vetting process about it, and um, and so myself or anyone else, we're all equals and I can be called on the carpet just as fast as anybody else. 
Yeah. Um, secondly, we're gifted because we're in an, a very, very fun industry. We're in the wine business. Um, can't get any more fun than than this. And um, and we're on the winemaking side. So you know, um, everything from crushing grapes to your feet to um, you know, going through an, a, a long sampling of, of wine. Last week we had a product development meeting, lasted two hours, probably was the loudest product development meeting anyone could ever be in because we had to, we had to taste through 45 different samples of wine. And um, I know we're supposed to spit and pour out, but after, after <laughs> the third or fourth. Um, it's so too good to do that, right? <laughs> it's, it's just, I, I, we're having too much fun, you know. I, I think that, that, that's the challenge, but... You know, for an entrepreneur to be able to be at the same time be in the wine business, it's it's truly one of the greatest gifts that that anyone could ask for. Yeah. Now, you know, most entrepreneurs, uh, you know, realize that being just just simply being an entrepreneur means that you've probably given up a a significant uh, portion of your life uh, to to this business in order to make it grow. Uh, how have, how have you been able to find uh, balance in uh, in the kinds of things that you have uh, that you do on your day to day, James? Well, I think you uh, definitely have brought up you know probably the most important point because as an entrepreneur and as a leader of, of a group, you've got to be consistent and on game every day. And and being able to do that means that you have to build repetition into a lot of the things that that you do and, and being in, you know, that repetition allows you to, to handle stress and handle uh, a lot of the challenges that you may face uh, that, um, that the average person is not going to have. And if you get used to it and it's just consistent, actually one of the challenges I have is I think that we've been walking on a high wire for so long mm-hmm. the way that we're growing that um, I'm, I have zero fear of what's below me. What I fear is is not taking risks. My my fear every day is that if you sit and you and you're not taking those risks, then then you're actually potentially stagnant. And so oh. enjoying to be on the high wire, developing you know a, a sense that that's where you're always supposed to be, um, uh, and being consistent with that allows you to always manage and handle whatever you're gonna you're going to come in contact with because that's what you're, you're here to do. And, and that makes you stronger and allows you to continue to do what you know, my primary role is. My primary role is to have a dream, have a vision, and, um, and all the other parts of being strong and, 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 and being entrepreneurial, et cetera, they all follow that. I, every day I still wake up, think about the dream. I actually have a five-minute uh, process I go through when I wake up in the morning where I, it's almost like resetting myself. I think about my, my, my physical health. I actually every day work out an hour a day. Excellent. I start my day. I, I bike every day. I get myself set physically. I get myself set mentally, and I go in with a plan. I don't do uh, thoughtless actions. I'm thinking about what I'm supposed to accomplish as, as an entrepreneur, as a leader, and um, making sure that I'm on game every day and doing it consistently. If I, if I only do it some of the time, then, then I don't have that kind of repetition that makes it habit. And so you've got to form these kinds of habits. And, and eventually it's easy. It's easy for me to work out every day. It's easy yeah. um, because I, I, made it, I made it a repetition. But since I, I, started out, I started out every day having my physical and my mental well-being taken care of first, and I can stay visionary too. I'm not. I'm not to come to all the challenges that everything else is happening. And I'm. And, and I'm also. Um, again, I. Some things can fail, and it. Uh, it doesn't bother me like it used to because I'm confident that the next day when I wake up, I'll still go through that process and I'll still be ready to drive forward, and and nothing's going to stop that. Nothing can stop that. So. Um, so that allows you to be optimistic. That allows you to be a, a great leader, and that allows you your dreams to come true. Wow, uh, uh, so many nuggets in that in in your last commentary there, James. Uh, totally appreciate you sharing that with the audience. I mean, I'm a I'm a great a uh, big proponent of, you know, why take into tomorrow? Why take into tomorrow the, the the you know the terrible day that you had today? You know, like do do away with it. You know, get on with it. Clear your head. Go and go forward. That's awesome. 
Um, Great advice. I, I've got to I've got to figure that uh, they always say that behind every uh, behind every successful uh, man is a uh, an even more successful woman, and probably at balancing. And I do understand. I think I read somewhere that you actually married your your high school sweetheart. Is that right? Yeah, we we live a really small town existence. Um, you know, I was born here. I'll die here. Um, I'm hoping for the same for my children. And and my wife is from a, a multi generational farm family here as well. Um, you know, I value those things more than money. I I I love what I'm doing entrepreneurially, but I'm not driven by by money. Um, I don't need a bigger house. I've already got everything that I I could ever dream of. I have a healthy family and a and a wonderful. Um, life in the in the country and uh, and I'm in a fantastic business that allows family to be a part of that and and family is you know a huge grounding element for everyone and and to have that um, be able to be integrated right into you know the wine business which is very family oriented um, again I, I have I have the best of both worlds I have an entrepreneurial journey at the same time I, I get to have um, you know a wife that is extremely supportive of that entrepreneurial side um, even though she isn't built and designed like myself, um, extremely supportive, and and now children in the business as well. My daughter mm-hmm. is my right hand man. She's she's 27 years old. She's uh, phenomenal at everything that that we task her with, and and um, and she's becoming a, a very good winemaker. My 19 year old son is making wine. Uh, you know, I grew up running around the cellar, so. Um, so I, you know, I, I I get to spoil myself that like very few businesses do by having my my family with me every day and and in a, in a very exciting and fun environment. So um, <laughs> I, I'm, I my life is terribly gifted and 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 I know that you know having that kind of gift means giving back as well. So I I we feel something very different about the way that we want to be an employer and how we want to build this entrepreneurial business, and, and we, we really want them included in the opportunity, um, you know, for the long term. Yeah. Tell us, uh, uh, you just mentioned giving back. Uh, how does that manifest itself in your organization? What, what kind of things are you involved in? Well, I think what we're involved in right now is, is we've gotten to a certain place that some would say is a plateau, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a place where, you know, we're, we're able to take a step back, take a deep breath, look at the future, and, um, and not just look at it optimistically, but look at it from a standpoint of what kind of company do we really want to be. Very, very few companies get that opportunity because they're, they're driven by other, other people's money or investors' money's expectations. And I think that um, by being able to take that, that kind of view that um, we need to include more into where we're trying to go and, and now have a platform to do that, we're, we're definitely pursuing the idea that we're going to be very open source in, in the future of, of the development of our products. Um, we're, very, um, we're very certain that there, there's a real stagnation that happens with all companies like ourselves because mm-hmm. of, of the way that the liquor laws are set up where things are very designed in a very uh, stoic way. I mean, obviously, you go into Canada or you go into the U.S., whatever province you're in or whatever state you're in, you're still going to be challenged with um, some laws that make it very, very limiting. Right. Um, but there are some real changes in the way that things are being distributed these days. And so we're we're right now at a point of redesigning how our company is going to be, including how you know how it affects the lives of, of our employees long term, and right. how it affects you know the social aspects of, of drinking uh, beverage. I mean, I, yeah. to me, the greatest moments in the day are shared over a glass of wine in face-to-face conversations with people. You can put all the social media together. You can do all the other things that you want to do out there. But the very greatest moment I can have is that interaction with somebody else. And our our company provides that by by being very good at what we do. And so, where can we go with that? And that that's what's so exciting for us right now is we're really trying to envision a different future than what most companies have ever been able to. Sounds like an interesting uh, platform to build your your company on. To tell you the truth, I think you've you, this is not this didn't come to you overnight. This is really well thought out. There's no question about that. Well done. Well done. Um, uh, James, what what are your own personal opinions about the beverage industry itself? I mean, there. I mean, 
you see it coming and going, and there's all kinds of imported uh, products. There's products that you've, I've never seen or heard before, mixtures of products. People are, are almost sacrificing uh, a quality element just for the sake of getting something new to market, and I know that you're not doing that, but what what are your what are your per, what's your personal opinion? You, uh, a wine man uh, think about the way things are running right now and in North America or anywhere for that matter. Uh, you know, I think it's the most exciting time uh, ever to be in the business that we're in, and the reason why is I think that technology has allowed the quality of the product that's inside the package to be. Um, to be at a level that the consumer's never been able to buy. 20 years ago, it was, it was typically light beer was the big innovation. Um, today, the amount of craft beer and high-quality beer that's in the marketplace is, is extraordinary, and, and, um, and the amount of incredible wine over the last 20 years that's now available at, uh, at uh, you know, a, a, a good price is, is mm. extraordinary, too. So... It's, it's, uh, I think the challenge really is, is the space is extremely crowded. Um, the amount of producers that are producing wine in the U.S., you know, it's, it's over 15,000 or 20,000 different wine licenses, and 20 years ago there was, there was somewhere probably around two to, two to three to 4,000. Um, wow. So it's, it's extraordinarily crowded, but, um, you know, the quality of wine that everyone's producing is fantastic. I think the challenge for the consumer is, is that um, how do they see through all the noise of, of so many different products? What am I really buying? Um, I uh-huh. think the excitement for the consumer is that they typically can go out and explore right now, and the quality is so high that they're rarely disappointed. 20 years ago, I could try a lot of different imported beers or, or, or different wines, and I could be substantially disappointed. Today, um, the quality is, is uh, definitely um, substantiated, so... Um, I think the challenge is in the wine business, obviously, of course, this, this is me talking about my own, um, my own business, but the fact is I have to buy four servings at once, open an entire bottle every time I want a glass of wine. Um, I think that that is uh, just almost a sin. Um, if I want a beer, I open a bottle of beer and I drink a beer. If I want a, a glass of wine, I open four glasses of wine that are sealed in a bottle, give right. myself uh, some glasses. Um, I, I think that higher quality wine in single serve packaging is, is definitely the most beneficial thing that will happen for the consumer and, and the wine business over the next 20 years. And we're just happy to be leading that charge. Yeah, no, it's great. I, I know I see it fitting into a lot of uh, uh, different elements, uh, uh, clubs, or where people gather, right. Uh, uh, for that, that just happen to have, um, happen to have an urge for something uh, of quality uh, but you know the laws permit you to uh, you know pull in a pull in your own bottle, right? So <laughs> I well, I mean, being able to go anywhere. I mean, one of the funny thing with social media is you you find out what people really think about what you're making, and and we see more posts, uh, you know, about the the lack of waste. We see the reuse of our glass. People are constantly reusing them for sippy cups and other things. Yes, we see um, we we see. Constantly, and and maybe this is where we need to go with their brand. But I constantly see pictures of women pulling them out of their purse. You know, here I am at this uh, event that uh, you know I'm at a barbecue, and then the guys all showed up with their beer, but no one thought about me, and I just pulled the copa right out of my purse. Um, right. I think that you know that you know it's it's, it's quite an amazing um, opportunity right now to to have more access to high quality products if you can put it in single servings. Uh, that sounds like the essence of a brand new marketing plan. That's for sure. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, Absolutely. Do <laughs> you agree? <laughs> you probably thought about it so. already, anyway. <laughs> um, now, you know the, the 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 thing about this the the the, the of any business is is this discipline, and and it it seems to discipline to get up every day and and put one foot in in front of the other. You've talked to us already about how how brilliant it is, you know, that you start your day off and you, you know, but you must have bad days. And if you do have bad days, how do you how do you get out of it? Because we have listeners who, you know, they're they they want they want to hear the 
they want to hear the bumps in the road too as much as the uh, uh, brilliant ideas. Yeah, I I have uh, you know as many bad days as anybody else. Um, what we're doing is is unique and challenging, and and so the you know I think the, the important thing is when you're having those bad days is that you that's when you rely on others. Others rely on me all the time, and if you're surrounded with the right kind of people, then those are the days when you can rely on others. And oftentimes they're going to give you the right kind of insight for you to go ahead and and shorten the recovery cycle. That's the key. It's mm. when, when you look at like a triathlete and they're just getting off the bicycle and they've got to get now, they've got to go and run another, uh, they've got to run a marathon next. Well, that recovery cycle is so, so important to them. Um, you, you, you look at, uh, you know, I just watched the U.S. Open, always so inspired by the mental game that's going on between these, these two uh, tennis players and, and how important it is and maybe this is where Serena ended up failing under the pressure of, of trying to get a true grand slam is that her mental recovery just wasn't fast enough she just couldn't you couldn't re, she couldn't restart and, and just forget the last point and get right on to the next point she was carrying points over and over again and and so they they steamroll and you're carrying that and and the only way for me to to try to burden unburden myself with that uh, the fastest way is is other people engaging yeah. with other people, telling them what you're challenged with because their objective. You're not going to find it in, the, in a self help book at that moment. You're not going to find it watching television. You're going to find it engaging with other people, face to face communication. That that has unbelievable value to you as an individual, and oftentimes it's completely ignored by by people. Uh, and 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 I think in our society actually. Uh, unfortunately, devalued at, at a level that it shouldn't be. Sitting at that communal table, at the family dinner table, and just having a 45-minute conversation while you eat, oh, my goodness, how much you can unburden yourself with the day and the next day be back on game. So you're back and ready for the next point. Wow. I'm loving that. That's fantastic, and thanks, thanks on behalf of the audience for sharing that thought. Um, without giving any trade secrets away, James, uh, what's cooking at uh, at Copa? What's uh, do you have something new on the on the menu yet? Oh, uh, you know, I, I think that our our we esteem we esteem as a company to to really change the way that people have access to to a high quality um, beverage, and so we don't feel like limiting ourselves to wine is is um is necessary. So um there's a world of mixology out there we're extremely excited about. Right. Um we're working on some new generation of packaging and you know and I, I do I do hate to say it, but um you know stay tuned. Um follow the program <laughs> um because uh you know there there is a backstory to our beginnings. Our beginnings really started on Shark Tank. And um, and we really do have that Darth Vader nemesis of, of Kevin O'Leary that's always trying to hunt us down. Right. Um, he did do another deal on on a, a recent Shark Tank episode with another wine by the glass company. And yes, I saw that. Out, but yeah, they were going to come out with something um, about six months ago, but uh, I think that maybe they failed. I have no idea. But I do know that, you know, in, in the back of my mind every day, I'm I'm running from Kevin O'Leary and trying to run so much further than he ever has because we value things completely different than he yeah. does. And and I would love to prove to everyone that chasing the dollar is, is, is not the most intelligent financial way to be an entrepreneur. Chasing yeah. the dream and the vision and thinking about who's your end user is how you will be successful. I love that, and you know what? In all honesty, if if Kevin had if Kevin knew the the real man that James Martin is, he probably wouldn't have even bothered because he probably he was beat before he got started. Quite frankly, and <laughs> just making that I just made that evaluation right 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 today. I mean, that's when I look at it, you're uh, you're like an ultimate warrior. You know, you're 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 kind of like a maverick of sorts. You know, you you're. You know who you are. That's I think that's so important too. I think you really know who you are, and uh, I don't think Kevin, uh, I don't think Kevin got even a glimpse 
of who you were. That's for sure. Absolutely. I love, uh, I read somewhere, I read somewhere one of your favorite quotes says uh, by one of my favorite people ever that lived in the world, uh, Winston Churchill, about never, never, never give up. I love that. You probably live that every day, I'm thinking. I have a pewter, I have a pewter plaque sitting on my desk. That's my paperweight that my daughter gave that to me maybe seven years ago, and <laughs> I live by that every day. Um, you have to plan on how you'll never give up, though. Never giving up is not the, not the only uh, thing you have to do. You have to have a plan of why you'll never give up and how you'll never give up. Yeah, that's a good additive because I think people just think that if you keep if you say it if you say something often enough, it'll come true, right? <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Jim, uh, uh, James, I, I have uh, seen the uh, clock on the wall, and it suggests that uh, uh, we've probably run out of time. Uh, quite frankly, I think we could have probably talked for an hour or two hours just on the Shark Tank uh, 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 story, but uh, uh, that would be giving them airtime, and this uh, this shows about you, <laughs> not about uh-huh. them. So well, have, uh, let me be the first. Time. Like, I'll, well, have me back some time, and I'll, I'll share some behind-the-scenes stories that you you wouldn't believe that uh happened on that show as well yeah i think i think that would make for a very intriguing show uh james uh uh let me be the first to say thank you on behalf of our audience for sharing this time with us i truly appreciate it and um i look forward to uh our follow-up call that you just suggested thank you thank you peter it's very enjoyable thanks thank you very much take care Take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of Journey to Success Radio. If you or anyone you know would like to be interviewed for the show, email Tom at TomTooTall.com for details.